missionaries with us. I'm not saying they're old. I'm just saying they've been missionaries a long time. Let's make that very clear. But uh, we are so thankful for uh, Brother and Sister McKenzie and the way they head up our missions ministry here at Faith Apostolic Church of Troy. You may be seated. Praise the Lord, saints. I have a couple of the young men that are going to help me this morning. I actually have a number of reports with which to be able to share with you that we received in. And, you know, sometimes we, uh, I like to, something kind of gets my attention when I look at these particular reports. And there's a couple things I wanted to share. And then uh, we have an update from Brother Howell that he'll be giving to us here in just a minute. But I know, you know, what moves this, the gospel? And I know that you know, the heartbeat of our missionaries helps move the gospel. But also know that there are physical needs that our missionaries face and that uh, they look to help to establish a work in each of these countries. And there was a couple things that caught my attention in the Dominican Republic. One of the projects, the projects that they have in that particular nation is to build a Bible school. And I thank the Lord for that that there's a place that people can go to learn the word of the Lord. And then also in, in Guatemala, just recently here in, uh, at the end of last year, they were able to dedicate a compound or a campus that had 13 buildings in it, 10 of which were homes, to be able to receive the needy children in Guatemala. I thank the Lord for that. You know, it, that doesn't just happen. You know, people sacrifice and give to be able to see the work of the Lord take place in these countries and to meet needs. The other thing I wanted to uh, touch on that I had an interesting thing happen here recently in my, my trip, I was reminded again of the life of our MK kids, our missionary kids. I thank the Lord for every one of those children, young people. Something happens in their lives. The, the work of the Lord gets embedded within them. And more than that, many times they become our missionaries. But I thank the Lord that, you know, it can be a challenge for a missionary kid. But I thank the Lord that there is a way through our social media that they are able to strengthen one another. Um, I saw it when I was in Cyprus, again, to see how that they're able to share with one another. And the work of the Lord that, that really gets developed within them. And not only that, but they are a hand outstretched also for, for that of which their parents do, that are called to. And it is a beautiful thing to see our missionary kids active in the work of the Lord and strengthening one another. I wanted to share this report from Brother Howell. This is his report that he gave us here in April. If you're able to bring it up and we can share it with everybody. You know, good things are happening. Some very good things are happening. He is actually talking. I can give you a brief synopsis of what he's telling you if this doesn't come up. Okay, one of the things that the Brother Howell is talking about here that I wanted to share with everybody, and, and if they can bring it back up, we'll maybe try that again. I can improvise if we have to. His... Um, one of the things he's talking about is, is in our general conference we had recently, there was a, a target that uh, the missions department have to send our missionaries back. There was pledged like $3.45 million. And actually what has happened to date, they have received over $3 million of that has already come in. We thank the Lord for that. You know, it is, it is moving the gospel. It is moving the gospel, and I, it, is a, it is a tremendous thing because we are a part of that giving, that we're able to see the work of the Lord take place. You know, in, in all things, we are blessed because 
not only is it in the fact that lives are being changed, but you know what? It can change us. When you catch a vision for world missions, it will change you. You will not be the same person. And I encourage everyone who ever has opportunity to go on the mission field as, a, as an aimer, as our, our, our youth uh, division has a chance to be a part of that. You know, it isn't just to go, but I tell you what, something will happen to you if you, are, if you have opportunity to be a part of that. I know Brother Gavin, when he went to Madagascar, he got it bad. He's got it really bad. And it, it just happens to you. It simply happens to you. Let's stand. I'm not sure this, we might try this again next time as far as to, to make that work. But let's pray for our missionaries. Lord Jesus, we thank you again that you can accomplish your work in every heart and every life, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you can open a door that no one else can open. And Lord, you can tear down strongholds that hold, Lord, your people, Lord, that desire to come to know you, Jesus. In all things, Lord, we lift you up to give glory to your name and know and trust in you in all things, Lord, that you can accomplish your work and your will in these last days, in these last hours. I thank you, Lord, the church has responded to the need. The church has desired to be a hand outstretched, to be able to reach out to souls, Lord, that they can come to know you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that our missionaries that have been able to return to their fields of labor, to be able to see souls saved, Lord, and that your word will be spoken and your word will be heard. Lord, that above all else, that names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, that they would come to know you in the fullness of truth. Their testimony before you, Lord, would be that they would please you. Lord, we give you the honor. We give you the glory. We give you the praise, Lord, in that holy name of Jesus today. We thank you, Lord. As our ushers come right now, I want to say we are so thankful for every one of you that are in the house of God this morning. We are so glad to have a first-time visitor today, uh, Brother Alberto from San Diego, California area. And my understanding is, Alberto, that you have been transitioned to this area for a while. Is that correct? And we are just so glad he's here worshiping with us in our Faith Apostolic Church family today. Make sure that he cannot even about get out of here without the love of Jesus Christ being showered upon him from the people of the Lord. Precious God, we're so thankful for another opportunity just to give to the cause of your kingdom. It's our our, our joy, Lord, as well as we understand your word that, that, that the tenth belongs to you. But it's our joy to not only return that to you, but then to give beyond that to the cause of your kingdom to bless your work. Thank you for the privilege of partnering with you in this way for the advance of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Bless you as you give. Oh God, my King, how your freedom washes over me and brings new light, brand new grace, brand new grace. So I will bring an offering, take all I have, take all of me in reverence to your majesty. Praise is up to the chains break, dancing your presence, hands of grace. This is the worship of your creation. Oh God, my King, how your freedom washes over me, brings new life, brand new grace, brand new grace. So I will bring an offering, take all I have, take all of me reverence to your majesty then i will sing i will sing and shout to the walls come down sing your praises up to the chains break dancing your presence hands of grace this is the worship of your creation i will sing and shout to the walls come down sing 
time can we worship the Lord give him praise and thanks for the victory hallelujah we are triumphant in his name hallelujah hallelujah we continue to rejoice in sowing and how many of you know what this is these are the church cards that you can use when you're in a restaurant and you have signed your little ticket, you can also slip one of these in there or just hand it to your server when you're at the cleaners, when you pick up your clothes and they give you your clothes, you can hand one of these to that person that is assisting you. Wherever we are at work, we can hand these out and on the back, all they have to do is scan that with the smartphone. It takes them straight to our website. And we can tell them that these services are webcast. Last week, we got our webcast up and running after several weeks of it being down. And I thought, wow, there probably won't be very many people viewing it. I looked at the map, and from all over the U.S., people were viewing our webcast last Sunday morning. And that's what I wanted to say about rejoice and sowing. When you get these out, it helps people that maybe they won't come in here yet, but they will view on the web and get a taste and you know what it is. You can't just eat one potato chip. Once you get a taste of something salty, and we're to be salt and light in the world, then we are able to draw more and more people in. Two, everybody say two weeks from today. Our revival starts with Brother Josh Herring. I want you to do everything you can to blanket your world with invitations to be in this house during those services. Can I hear an Amen. And right now, it is my joy and privilege to introduce a longtime friend of mine that is really no stranger to Faith Apostolic Church of Troy. We have supported this couple for many, many years, and it's been our joy to do so from the Philippines to the Czech Republic, and now they are regional directors of the whole South Pacific region, and we are so thankful thankful for the work they're doing for the Lord. Let's welcome Brother Roger and Sister Becky Buckland. Thank you, Pastor Walker. You may be seated, and what a joy it is to be with Faith Apostolic Church today. I am so pleased, and first thing I want to say is thank you for sharing your pastor and wife with our region. They just recently returned from New Zealand. And so if they go to sleep during the church service, that's okay. I understand. But uh, I appreciate a church's willingness to share their pastor. I know you suffer when they're gone, but thank you for sharing. I mean that. Uh, thank you for sharing. I remember when I was pastoring and I would have an invitation to go out, some people in the church I pastored got a little bit upset and said, Pastor, how come you're gone? You know, you... I said, well, wouldn't you hate to have a pastor that nobody, ever, uh, nobody else ever wanted to hear? <laughs> so you're blessed to have that type of a pastor and wife here, and thank you for sharing them. Amen. Thank you for sharing them. And your pastor mentioned that you have been faithful in supporting our ministry. And uh, I want to say, since 1993, this church has supported us. Man, it's hard to find words to top that. 
Really, thank you. That's the best I can say. Appreciation, that's good, but thank you. And I know it's a sacrifice, some of you giving for missions, and thank you for doing it. You know what Jesus said? He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. Tap your neighbor. Tell him he's talking about you. <laughs> go ye into all the world. Amen. That's our responsibility. Now, I recognize we can't all go in person, but we can all go in purse. Hello. I think I should repeat that. <clears throat> can't all go in person, but we can all go in person. If you are not giving to missions, it's time you started. Hallelujah. Don't, don't depend on everybody else to do it. You can do your part. And it, it, it doesn't matter your status in life. You can do something. And so we thank you. Hallelujah. Well, trying to get all these things out of the way before we get into the good stuff. Sister Buckland, come on up here. I appreciate my wife. She's a tremendous, tremendous woman. And uh, uh, not too many ladies would be willing to traipse around the world all the time and not have a place of their own. And, but I did tell her I would buy her a really nice suitcase. <laughs> uh, I love her. I appreciate her. We've been missionaries since 1984. So that's, that's a generation just about. And I thank her for being a wonderful wife, mother to our children, a woman who loves God, a Christian, and a lady. And I'm blessed to have her as my wife. Come and talk to us, Sister Buck. Right. Is it possible to take this out? There you go. God bless you all. It is truly, truly a blessing and a joy to be here on this wonderful spring day with you in Michigan. <laughs> but truly to be with Brother and Sister Walker. And I believe this is probably our third or fourth visit to this church in the last 32 years of our missionary uh, ministry. And I just... You know, before every service, it almost seems before every service, we have a time of reflection on our own life and our own ministry, and especially so when we know that we're going to be with friends. And you know, we can look back at our life, and when we said yes to God all that time ago, we had absolutely no idea the places that he would have us to go and the things that he would have us to do. But I'm just thankful that that he counts me worthy to do his ministry. And we thank churches just like yours. And we first started off in the Philippines 32 years ago, and our sons were five and three when we left for the field. And they're both grown young men now, and our oldest grandson is 10. And we have four grandsons, and our youngest grandson is two. So time, how quickly time goes. But we are so thankful that our oldest son, Matthew, and his wife and two sons, five and two, are on deputation now, and they are going to the Czech Republic. So uh, we're so thankful for that, and hopefully they should be able to go by this summer, we're hoping, in Jesus' name. But, ten, you know, those years ago in the Philippine Islands, we just, we were so involved in, in Bible school ministry, and my husband was like superintendent of, Mich of um, Mindanao Island, and at that time there were nearly 400 churches. It was a really, really large island, and we were so busy, involved, just head over heels, in love with the people, in love with God's work, love teaching Bible school, but God began to deal with us, and I believe I left my testimony when I was here maybe 10 years ago, or 12, I don't know, but maybe some of you will remember, but at that time, my husband was, during those years in the Philippines, my husband uh, did a lot of traveling, and he was gone a lot to other islands because the, we had children at home. We didn't travel with him at all times, but this, on one particular trip, my husband went to the island of Palawan, and I believe it was for a youth camp or something of that sort. I was home with the boys, and because of the political situation at that time in the Philippines, we uh, had a German Shepherd guard dog that was in our yard. Does anyone remember my story? One or two or three or four. I don't want to repeat if it's not. Oh, you remember? I think you probably do. <laughs> but because of the situation, um, 
In fact, we had armed guards on our street with machine guns, and then our house was behind a brick wall, and then on top of the brick wall we had, you know, something else to try to help prevent people from going. And then on top of all that, we had a German Shepherd guard dog in our yard. And uh, my husband was gone, and I opened up the, the patio door in the morning, and Bruno met me there, and he was our fully grown male black German Shepherd dog, and it worked. He kept people away. Um, but I looked at him, and he was just, he just, he had fun in our yard all night long. He dug holes through our yard. Our banana trees were laying every which way. And he met me there at the door, the screen door that morning, with dirt all over his face. And I said, Bruno Buckland, what in the world? And my first thought was, Matthew and Jonathan need to come out of the house, go through the courtyard, and go out to go to school. And my first thought was, that dog is going to get our boys filthy before they even get to school. So I didn't even have a thought. I didn't have a second thought. But I, in the process of going outside to get the chain around Bruno's neck and to get him this great big dog, my, as my brother says, dog. But as I went out there to get him chained up, it, Bruno bit me on the arm, on the wrist. And long story short, before the, my boys came home from school that day, Bruno died right there on the porch where I had tied him up. And come to find out, through a whole long series of things that took place, Bruno did die of rabies. And my husband was gone, and here I am. He comes back 10 days later to a sick wife, and anyway, really long story. But we ended up going back to the States after an earthquake, after killing the 16th cobra snake in our yard, after a hand grenade, after a crack in the airplane. We made it back to the States, stress-free. And, <laughs> and within hours of landing in the States, uh, there in Indianapolis, I was able to meet with an infectious disease uh, disease specialist, and that doctor only gave me 90 days to live. But you know what? Here I am today. Here I am today. I am standing here. I am free, and he made me whole. And uh, so, but beware, because sometimes I still kind of foam at the mouth. <laughs> but, uh, but you know what? It was through that really dark time in our life <clears throat> that really, even prior to that, the days and weeks and even months prior to that incident, the Lord was working on my husband and I, on our hearts and on our lives, because we were reading newspaper articles of the Berlin Wall falling in Eastern Europe. And it was the Lord used that situation really to lift us up out of the Philippines and, and transfer our whole focus in ministry to Eastern Europe. And so we landed in what was in Czechoslovakia, but now it's Czech Republic and Slovakia, and uh, without a name, without a contact or anything. And we were there for 19 years. And so God just, you know, so sometimes don't always blame your troubles on the devil. Don't always do that because sometimes the Lord, he's just working on you. He may be working on your patience. He may be working on your trust. There's a whole lot of things. He may be working on your character. There's a lot of things that the Lord just does and allows to come to our life to make us in his own image. And so, you know, uh, it was through that storm that the Lord led us to Eastern Europe. And we were there for 19 years and opened up a Bible school and started the first work in the country. And so we're thankful that our son and family is going there to take, take that over. Over. Um, but then when Brother Richard Denny, the Pacific Regional Director, retired, it came time for him to retire, the Global Missions Board asked my husband to, um, if we would consider going back to the Pacific region as regional directors. They really needed someone that had experience with the Philippine Islands, as it is the largest work outside of the United States as far as churches. And so here we are. Now, all these years later, it's been three and a half years that we've had this responsibility. And it's 24 nations all over, all over the, all over the country. I'm all over the water, actually, starting from um, Philippines to Il Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, down to New Zealand and Australia, Papua New Guinea, all the countries, all the little islands out in the sea. It's thousands and thousands of islands, and our we have a um, <clears throat> a motto or a theme. It's to reach every inhabited island with the apostolic gospel through apostolic ministry through you're working together in, in apostolic ministry. So we are just we are just really excited. But right now we have so many because of retirements of missionaries and other things that have taken place, we 
we really are asking God for Bible school administrators and teachers. We have several countries. We have Bible schools that are just sitting there because of the retirement of the missionary. And that's the ache of our heart. Lord, this is the future of the work. And so please pray with us. If you want to pray with us, we really need, we need educators. We need Christian educators who can take up that slack. We can give the torch to the next generation to develop ministers because we have thousands of islands. Indonesia is asking for a missionary. It's the fourth most populated nation in the world, right under the United States. And there are 18,000 islands there. And we need a missionary. And it's predominantly Muslim. But right now, it's it's not illegal to, to convert. It's not illegal to convert. And so it's every day, a month that goes by, we feel like we're missing the boat. The sands of time are going through. And it's not anyone going to go. We just feel this responsibility so greatly. Malaysia, we've got college kids that are just, they're asking they're asking brother buckland are we going to have a, a bible school to train for ministry we say we're praying about it we're tweeting about it we're facebooking about it instagramming about it we're doing everything about it but god god just please pray for us will you in that regard the lord is so good and we thank churches just like you that cover us with prayer and we appreciate you we, quite possibly it could have been your life your prayer that saved my life and i i thank you for that god bless you i'm not here to preach but anyway <laughs> in jesus name we love you all and thank you in jesus name Thank you, Sister Buckland. Amen. And uh, some of you have noticed there's a little box over here. It's setting in a mini ocean. See, it's terrible when you have a display and then have to, you know, explain it. <laughs> That's a little puddle of an ocean right there. And uh, there's a box. And if you look on the box, there's uh, seahorses and starfish and things like that, just to kind of give you the atmosphere of where we're at. But uh, I have some brochures there. Everybody can have one. There's enough for everybody to have one. If not, I've got some more in the van out there. It tells a little bit about us and our ministry and what God is helping us with. Uh, but the reason the box is there, I've already talked to Pastor Walker, and he gave me permission to do this. I'm raising funds to help a little bit with uh, my flight. I just raised funds uh, in the last two weeks up in Maine and Massachusetts, and they gave me enough money for my wife to make the trip we're going on to Australia, Samoa, the Torres Straits, and Tonga. We're leaving there next in just a little over a month and going back, so we've got those funds raised. But then I get back for about two weeks, and then I have to leave and go to Malaysia and for their conference, and then the Philippines for their executive board meetings back to Guam for their conference. So I'm, I'm having to raise the funds for that. So if you'd like to help, uh, if anybody would like to help, whatever goes in that box after service is going to go to help with that. How's that? <laughs> I just need, let me see, how much? $3,178.51. <laughs> uh, you don't have to give it all. I mean, but if you'd like, you know what I've learned? God's people like to help. And so all I do is when I go to our churches, I make known the need. And if you can help, thank you. If not, we understand. If you want to write a check, make it out to Faith Apostolic Church. Okay, and he'll put it all in one big pile and write one check for it. How's that? <clears throat> By faith. Okay. Just thought I'd let you know. We just returned from the Philippines in the month of February. Some of you have heard about it. I don't know if they got the sound going, but I'll give you just a little clip from that. They can stick it up there. In one service, we had 35 to 40,000 people there. We had an outdoor soccer stadium. And in that one afternoon, we had nearly 5,000 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You can see there's a sea of people. I wish you could hear the sound, the roar of the sound. It's going to be a great time when we get to heaven, folks. Hallelujah. It's going to be a great time when we get to heaven. And it's, we're all going to be there. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, if we've obeyed the gospel and living our life right, we're going to be there. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And I see our sisters from Fiji. Oh, I'm telling you what, we have a powerful church in Fiji. I love going to their conference. You know, in their conference, it's in the month of December. It's, it rains. And we have it outdoors. Hallelujah. It doesn't stop the Fijians. 
No, no, no. We're out in the public square right downtown. And they're out dancing before the Lord and the rain's just a-falling. It's, a, it's an experience, Brother Walker. You're going to have to come sometime. I'll see what I can do about that. But you've got to preach in the rain. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you get to stand out there in the rain and preach, and it's a beautiful thing. Not only does it rain naturally, but it rains spiritually. And what a great, great time and a great church we have in Fiji. I wish I could tell you about every one of the countries, but actually there's 26 nations that we represent, and I can't tell you about every one of them, but my wife told you right. Indonesia is so large, the westernmost island to the easternmost island is as wide as San Francisco to New York City. You look at it on a map, and it just looks like that, but it's wide. It really is, and we have an abundance of islands an abundance of people that need God. Oh, I'll tell you something. It's going to be a great, great day. If you feel like you'd like to make a missions trip, be on the AIM program for at least two months. Don't, don't talk about your age. We have the oldest aimer in our region. Yes, he's 92. You didn't think you could do something for God? Well, I know you're not that old yet, but, you know, just in case you were over 50, you didn't think you could be used. You can be used by God. We just had a named couple that they, we do have them right now. They are in the kingdom of Tonga. What a blessing. He's in his mid-60s. He's been there for about seven weeks now. I just got his report, almost wept as I read his report of what God is doing through them teaching and going to the churches and blessing those churches. Oh, you can do something for God. Amen. Amen. That's not an altar call. It's just an observation. Hallelujah. Did I say everything yet, Sister Buckland, before I preached? If not, ask my wife after church. Okay. Stand with me, if you would, for the reading of the Word from Isaiah 42. I'd just like to read a couple verses, give you a little inspiration today. I know God's going to meet with us because He already has. And He didn't leave. He didn't leave. Those of you I know, it's so good to see you again. I've met some of you on the mission field. God bless you. Amen. Almost makes me wonder if you've heard me preach this message. But it doesn't matter because it's for here, for today. Isaiah 42, verse 10, Sing unto the Lord a new song, and His praise from the end of the earth. I've been there. <laughs> Ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof, let the wilderness and the cities lift, thereof lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar doth inhabit. Let the inhabitants of the rocks sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. And then verse 12. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare His praise in the islands. Hallelujah. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare His praise in the islands. Glory. You may be seated. I want to talk for a little bit this morning about, I said this morning, it's already after morning. So, this noon, this noon hour. How many believe I can be done by one o'clock? Oh, you know your pastor. Okay. We're from the same generation. <laughs> what is a new song? It says singing of the Lord, a new song. What is a new song? A new song is a song you don't know. See, I used to struggle with that because, you know, in our day, we have a lot of new songs. I have trouble with the rhythm. I'm not saying they're wrong. They're beautiful. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people get, I have a trouble with them. That's me. But after, you know, a decade of them, I can get it. <laughs> you know what I've learned? The old songs are new to some people. So we can always fulfill this verse. See, 
Now, I'm not against the old songs. I'm not against the new songs. Please understand me. I love to worship God. This worship here this afternoon, oh, man, it was just from the heart. And that's, that's the thing that's important if it's from the heart. Amen. So we sing a new song. So when I go over there, I teach them the old songs, and they think they're new, and we have a great time. Amen. Islands. How are islands formed? To declare his praise in the islands. How are islands formed? Volcanoes, exactly right. Volcanoes. Deep within the earth, there's this liquid rock that's called magma. Magma. That's not science today, but i got to tell you a little bit of this so you can get it. This magma. And when introduced to various gases, this magma starts to expand. It needs to find a way to get out. And After it boils and boils and it expands down there into the earth for so long, it has to find an exit. And so it shoots up and you see this big... Cone, you might would say, go up, and this spews out, and this magma, when it hits the air, it's no longer called magma, but it's called lava. Lava. And this lava goes down the side of this cone until it does it after several, several times. It'll finally push its way above the sea, and then you have a little rock formation out there in the ocean. And after... An amount of time, I don't know how long it takes. It takes a long time. Maybe a fish swims up there and dies or something. And, or maybe a bird drops a seed or something. After a, a long time, I don't know how long, I didn't video it. But after a long time, you can look this up and, you know, that's the, one of the privileges today. Everybody can learn all about this, so I won't take all the time to describe it. Then some foliage comes and some trees, and after a while, you have a beautiful paradise, you might say. That's how islands are formed. And, and the thing is, islands are volcanoes. Volcanoes, when they erupt, they affect everything around them. Everything's affected. And you know what? Every individual sitting here today is a volcano on the sea of humanity. You and I are a volcano. Yeah, we're a volcano. Oh, did I tell you about the title of my message? I better go back. The title of the message, if I had a title to it, is A Burning Desire Fulfilled. A Burning Desire Fulfilled. Now, there are three types of volcanoes. I don't want to bore you with this, but I've got to lay this foundation, okay? Three types of volcanoes. There's one that's called an active volcano. There's a dormant volcano. And there's, there's an extinct volcano. Now, just in my observations, and I was able to sit up here and look out over the congregation, I believe everybody here falls within two of these categories. We're either active or dormant. I don't think anybody here is extinct. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a little description. This is what I, when I looked it up, this is what it says. Active volcanoes are continually erupting. And that's what I saw around here today. Amen. We have some people that have something on the inside that keeps building up that it's got to find a way to get out. Amen. That's called an active volcano. And then there's ones that are called dormant volcanoes. Now, dormant volcanoes, they have not erupted for a long time. But there's still fire down in there, and they can erupt. Amen. They're called dormant. But they still got the fire. It just hasn't erupted for a while. And then there's the extinct volcano. The extinct volcano, it'll never erupt again. So that's why I hope nobody hears like that. <laughs> Give you a little island history here. How's that? Amen. Now, that's just the little backdrop of the message. I want to look at the first miracle that Jesus did. Does anybody know what that was? Turning the water into wine. Yes, exactly. Uh, this is in Canaan of Galilee. In Canaan of Galilee. The turning of the water to wine. Jesus came to the marriage feast, and his mother said unto him, Son, they have no wine. <laughs> uh, you have to understand something 
about men and women. There's a little difference in them, okay? When Mary said they have no wine, that's not what she meant. For example, if we're at our house, uh, this is a, you know, just in case there was one, but if we were there and my wife would look at me and says, the trash is full. That's what she says, but that's not what she means. You get my drift? When my wife says the trash is full, she's not making a statement. She says, go take out the trash. That's what she means. That's not what she says, but that's what she means. I thought at least 50% of you would agree with me. Huh? <laughs> when Mary looks at Jesus and says, they have no wine. What she really meant, do something about it. Hello, I don't know if you're with me yet or you're nervous or something. I don't know. Maybe it's me that's nervous. I don't know. But with this understanding, Mary says they have no wine. I want you to do something about it, really, is what she meant. Jesus looked at her and says, Woman, what have I to do with you? It's not time for me to begin my miracle ministry. That's, that's what he said. He said, Mine hour's not yet come. But that's what he meant. It's not time for me to begin. It didn't detour her one bit. When Jesus told her, It's not time for me to start my miracle ministry, she just turned to the servants and she said, Whatever this guy tells you to do, you do it. It didn't stop her one bit. Oh, I want to tell you something, folks. There was something down inside of Mary that caused her to initiate a miracle. Yes. I want you to get this with me because you're getting ready to go into revival. I think you can have the best revival you've ever had if somebody will get a desire to see God do it. She says to the servants, whatever he says to do, do it. Well, I guess Jesus heard her. So he looks at the servants and he says, uh, see those water pots? Uh, go fill them with water. Well, now why were water pots there to start with? I'll tell you what they were there for. They were there for the purpose of cleansing, purification. Hello. I still believe in purity. I still believe there's a distinction for the people of God. And the precursor to the miracle was it had to be involved with purity. Well, you can study all that out. So they, these guys take it and they fill them up two or three firkins apiece. Now, how much is a firkin? Does anybody know? Six gallons? Oh, that's a good guess. Any other expertise? I forget, and I didn't write it down. So you can look that up. If it was seven, that's 21 gallon of water. That's, that's pretty heavy. Right? If it was six, that's 18 gallons of water. I apologize. I'm going to have to look this up. So I did, but I forgot. So they come lugging this water back in there. And uh, when they set it down, Jesus looks at them and says, Now you take out from that and bear it to the governor of the feast. Well, we know the story that when they took the water there, it was wine. Now I'm not going to go into a theological discussion with you just to let you know it was not fermented. Okay. Just going to let you know that. Jesus would not have served an alcoholic beverage, especially for a new bride and groom. Hello. I won't go into all that. You can talk to your pastor. I like to leave him something to do. <laughs> I'm going to back off from that, and I'm going to talk about the boldness of Mary. What gave her the impetus? What gave her the audacity to tell Jesus to do something? I mean, it, it, that's pretty bold. 
as far as I'm concerned. Now, I know that she was his mother. I understand. But let me go backwards a little bit and explain some things about this scenario. How old was Jesus when this miracle took place? Anybody have a... Around 30 years of age. Okay. How long did Mary know who Jesus was? Nobody knew that he was the Son of God better than Mary knew it. Mary knew who he was. Mary knew what he could do. Mary knew the power he had. And he had lived in her home for 30 years and she had never seen a miracle. Hello. She knew he could do it. She knew he had all the power of the world in his hands. She knew that, but had never seen it displayed. I want to tell you, when you know something like this, there's nobody that knows who Jesus is like the oneness apostolic Pentecostals. Nobody knows who he is like we know. We know He is the mighty God. We know He is the everlasting Father. We know He is the Prince of Peace. We know He can do all things. And sometimes we sit and never see it happen. I think we need some little impetus in us. It happened with Mary. It really did. I want, I want to take you back to the book of Luke, chapter 2, and verse number 19. This is after the uh, angel, I mean, excuse me, after the shepherds had come at the birth of Christ. After the shepherds came and they were all around the manger scene, yeah, and then they left and, and the shepherds went and go tell it on the mountain. You know, they did their part and they left and, and Mary was left. Look what it says that happened with her. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She let some seed get down with inside of her of knowledge that he was someone special that could do something special. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know how long you've been going to this church. And I don't know. It doesn't matter how long you've been as far as, as a Christian. It doesn't matter. But if you've had a desire. If you've had that desire click inside of you. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of fertilizer on top of the fire to get something to explode. Hallelujah. And then a little later in the life of Jesus, we don't know, maybe it was 11, maybe 12, maybe 13. I don't know. Is this when Jesus went down to Jerusalem? You know the story, how he went for the do after the custom of the Jewish boys. Look at it in verse number 51 of Luke chapter 2. It says that after Mary and Joseph went back to Jerusalem looking for Jesus and they couldn't find him in four days and, and finally they uh, found him and said, Wish you not that I must be about my father's business. This is what Mary, it says. And he went down with them after he said that and it and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them but his mothers kept all these sayings in her heart I don't know what I'm feeling right now but I'm feeling something I'm feeling that there's a that there is a a, a volcano among us that if somehow it can be introduced to the right substances that that purpose that has been inbred within us could somehow begin to rise up within us to where we could explode in worship. It's going to affect everybody around us. It's going to affect our community. It's going to affect your neighborhood. It will affect your family and your extended family if we'll just allow God to let it explode within us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we can just let it happen. We've been missionaries now for 32 years. And I've, I've, I've known from the beginning that missionaries have great stories. You know, that's why we like to have missionaries come, you know, tell those great stories, don't you? I mean, when I was growing up in the church, that was one of my favorite services. We had I loved it when they almost got killed. You know, God delivered them. You know what I'm saying? You want to have those kind of, I don't know if you want those stories or not. You know, don't you love to hear it when God heals somebody from cancer? <laughs> but we don't want the cancer. You know, that's what I'm talking about. 
but there's something that's been dropped within us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. There's a seed of magma that's been dropped within the spirit and hearts of every one of God's believers. And if we can get the right combination within the inside to allow that to begin to boil up within inside of us to the place that where we get enough boldness that we can do like he read at the beginning of the scriptures today that we can step into the throne of grace and we can ask God for what we need I'm telling you we're living in a day when I believe we're going to see more than we've ever seen people talk about how bad it is with the political scenery and I understand I've I gripe about it too and all of that and the things that are happening going down in our world and how it's looking bad for the church and things like that. I understand all of that. But none of us are living in a time that was worse than the apostles lived. It was much worse on them. They were in an occupied place. They were in a ruthless government that was over them. And yet the church flourished. The church arose above it. It didn't allow that to bother them because they had a mission on the inside. Something that was dropped inside of them that said they could go into the whole world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. And that is a, the, the day that we're living in, folks. I'm telling you, the best, best day for the church is here now. Because God has dropped into the hearts of his believers this, this little bit of seed of magma that's begin to swell and expand within inside of us spiritually. <laughs> I, I know it's just a little bit of a thought with us today, but brother, uh, brother, it starts with an M. I'll get it in a moment. Uh, I wrote it down because I want to give him, oh, brother Wayne Huntley. Didn't start with an M. Start with, Brother Wayne Huntley, I heard him preaching once and talking about this miracle at Cain of Galilee. And you know the, the saying, the best for last? You know, most people base it on this story. That's not what it says. No. It's, it's not the best for last. Look at what it says in John chapter 2, verse 10. And, and saith unto them, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. When can I have this volcano erupt with inside of me? We're in the last days, I know that. I know that, but the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former house. And I believe the greatest time for a move of God in our hearts is now. Now. I grew up in a great church. My parents came in the church when I was one year old. So I've been involved with the church for 60 years now. That's kind of neat to say. I know you didn't know I was that old, but 61. I'm trying to act more like it. But I remember growing up in church back in those days. We had revivals. Six, seven weeks. I mean, we'd have revival... Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Monday was a rest night, so we'd usually have prayer meeting. My dad worked a job for Ford Motor. He had to get up at work, 6, 7 o'clock, every day. My brother and I went to school. We went to church every night. They'd, we'd go to sleep and they'd put us under the pew because they didn't want us to be stepped on when people were shouting. I'm just doing a little memory. A little memory. And I'm not, I'm not uh, being critical of what we do today. We do what we have to do and how we have to do it. I understand that. But I want to tell you what it was like when there was a burning desire in their hearts 
my uncle, God love him, he was a businessman. Still is, he's still living, he's 92. I love to go out with him because I'm young. I was there one of those Monday nights, or one of those revival nights. I think it was a Monday night after the prayer meeting. He went home and he and his wife were so hungry for the Holy Ghost that they were praying in their apartment and they would disturb the neighbors. And so he called my dad and he said, can we come to your house and pray? I remember it distinctly. I remember hiding under the kitchen table. My uncle Calvin was there praying to the wee hours of the morning on the night off because he wanted God. He wanted the Holy Ghost. What would happen if something would grip us to such an extent that we won't take no for an answer. Amen. I remember a revival. I, don't, I think we had 27 or so. I, and, and one of those revivals, revivals, Sister Willie Johnson, back years ago. Sister Willie Johnson preached in my home church. And that's when my family came in. I was just one, but I've heard about it. She wore the cape and sang songs. And what a, what a ministry. I think it was 17 from that one family came in in that revival. That revival my family came in. I remember a revival when I was just a young person in the church. And I'll never forget. I don't even remember who preached the revival. But I remember there was a man in our church that led the song service. Something happened to him in that revival. Because every night when he would step to that pulpit, he would begin to weep and sing. And, and most of the nights, the evangelists didn't even get to preach because something happened with that one man. Listen to me. What would happen if even one per area would be touched? I'm going to tell you something. It's something that doesn't affect just you. And you know what I think is great? Is when I see the elders start getting touched. <laughs> I'll never forget watching Brother Becton get down and roll on the platform. That's an elder. That does something to me. Sometimes we elders, you know, we've already paid the price, we think, and we don't need to do it. But listen to me. The impact we make on the next generation if I can be a volcano that's an active volcano. The thing that I like about the dormant volcano, the, the thing I like about it said when I read it, it still has fire in there. And it can erupt. And I travel all over the United States. I travel to all of, many of our churches. You know that because of our responsibilities. And, and a lot of people I see are dormant volcanoes. And I just long to see them get restoked. I really do. I long to see us get restoked and let that fire begin to come to where we can't stand it until we see a move of God. So as a regional director responsible for 26 nations, we have a nation in our region that's had had a missionary there back in the 40s. But because of war, they had to leave. And so they became nationalized and they've had to go on their own. But they've drifted. They've drifted. If you walked into there, you wouldn't even think they were one of our churches. But they are. And I get to, I get to go in and be among them. But they know from their beginnings what it was like. I dare say some of you have been in services here where you didn't even want to leave. <laughs> where the glory of God was so phenomenal. I know that. I know that. I know that. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not coming here today uh, being critical. I'm not coming here being... Uh, I just want to remind us that every one of us is responsible not only for our own salvation, but to affect those around us. And we can do that by being a volcano exploding.
Thank you. Let's stand together. God has put us in this sea of humanity in the year 2016, every one of us. Every one of us, God has placed us here at this time. He really has. Why? Because He wants us to affect our generation. He wants you and He wants me to affect our generation. He put the seed within us. He did. He, when He touched us with His Spirit, when He touched us with His presence, when He's opened His Word to us, we know who He is. We know what He can do. We know He has ultimate power. So, somehow we've just got to let the fire get stoked within us. So I'm going to ask this morning if there's anybody that would really like God to use you in such a way. I've got a great uncle, Uncle Ophi. He's, he's gone on to be with the Lord. Just a little old man. <laughs> he had diabetes. He's just a little old fellow, about this big around, about this tall. But he would testify. He sat right about there, about a third of the way back, and he would get up to testify. And when he would get up to testify, he would start saying, I want to thank God. And then he'd start to shake. Just that little old man, he carried the mantle, and he'd start to shake. Little white hair and those glasses. And before he got done testifying, he'd get out in that aisle and he'd run around our church. Get back to his place. Everybody's affected. Everybody was affected. Everybody was affected. I want to have a life as a volcano that everybody that comes near me are affected. I was in the Philippines when Mount Pinatubo blew. Everything was affected. The bases had to leave. Everything was affected by that one eruption. Everything. It's not even the same today as it was back then because of that one eruption. What would happen if I would allow God to explode with inside of me that I could spew out His praises to such an extent everybody would be affected. Everybody in my neighborhood, everybody in my family, everybody in my church. It can happen. Because that's the nature of a volcano. If you want God to use you in such a way, would you be willing just to step out and come down around the front for a little while and let that mercy of God touch you once again? You know, we're not ignorant here. Every one of us know what I'm talking about. Every one of us know what I'm talking about. I don't know what it is, if it's our busyness in society that we have today. I don't know what all it is. There's so many things that vie for our attention, and it's sometimes hard to concentrate on one thing very long. But what if? What if we would allow that presence of God to just kind of start to You've, got, you've received promises. Some of you have received promises of lost loved ones. Children, you've, you've received that promise. Wouldn't it be great that somehow God would just put the right combination that that would begin to yearn inside of you once again? That you would see it happen. Maybe God wanted you to step out in some type of a ministry or something, but you've just kind of let it be on the shelf. I want God to stir it up again. I want Him to stir it up again because it's so important in our day that we're living that we are who God wants us to be so that we can affect our generation. Raise your hand with me right now. Say your prayer unto Him. La Mashiach 
Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Shamahasi. Shamahasi. That's it. That's it. Come on. Let it stir up a little bit. Let the magma roll. Yeah, let it roll. Thirty years, Mary let it roll. She let it boil and burn within her. Till when the opportunity came, she grabbed a hold of it. Shamahasa, that's it. Let him talk to you. Let him stir it again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. I agree with you, God. 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 Here I am. Here I am, God. Here I am, God. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Use me, God. Use me, God. Use me for your glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. individually volcanoes but I also want you to know that this church is essential for this part of the for this part of the state it's important it's important that this church be a volcano even for the surrounding churches it's very important so I want to thank you for making yourself available to him for what he wants to do in these final days God bless you, Pastor. Remember that old W.C. Parkey song, Lord.
This is an old song that was written by W.C. Parkey. And as Brother Buckland was ministering, I just, that song just came back to me. And I remembered as a, I suppose, a late teen, early 20s, even into the 30s, we sang this song. But it, it's just a prayer about exactly what Brother Buckland has preached. I don't know. I just. God has been moving. He has been working. He has been positioning. Everybody say positioning. That's what God's been doing with us as a body. He's been positioning us. And he even spoke to my wife. I don't know, honey. Was that two years ago? Three years ago? I can't remember exactly when. But God was positioning us as a church for a mighty outpouring and demonstration of his grace to save. And I am just believing that that is exactly what God wants. I believe there's something about 2016. Would you say 2016? Here, while the America seems to be divided and in turmoil over all this political stuff. Let me tell you, as I've said before, and I'll say again, our hope is not in political parties. Our hope is not in governmental. I'd rather have ones that are more God-fearing that are not God-fearing in those positions, obviously. And I tell you to vote, exercise your, your, your right as a citizen to vote and, and do your voting based on biblicity. And you, you and God decide that between yourselves. But we're not looking for that as our, there's one Savior. There's one Savior. There is one that has a plan that's so much bigger than any political party's plan, any government of this world's plan. And we've got to realize we're citizens of the New Jerusalem, and we have to put our first allegiance to his purpose, his plan, his kingdom, his will. But if I'm going to do that, I've got to just make this old song that precious brother W.C. Parkey that's gone on to be with the Lord for many years now. He said, Lord, set me a fire, make me a flame for you. Millions are lost, but you paid the cost that they all might be free lord i am yearning oh set me a burning let me cry out in jesus name set me fire set me a fire make me a flame oh Set me a fire, oh, make me a flame. This is one of those new songs to some of you. Millions are lost, but you paid the cost that they all might be free. Lord, I am yearning, oh, set me a burning. Let me cry out in Jesus' name. Here's my desire. Set me a fire and make me a flame. Now try to sing it with us. Some of us know it. Oh, Lord, set me a fire. Make me a flame for Thee. Millions are lost, but you paid the cost that they all might be free. So, Lord, I am yearning. Oh, set me a burning and let me cry out. In Jesus' name, here's my desire. Set me a fire. 
and make me a flame. Would you just raise your hands and just make that prayer your prayer. Lord, set me a fire. Set me a fire. I'm yearning. I'm burning. Let me begin to shine out for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the kingdom. Because millions are lost while well, he's already paid the cost that they might be free. But it's up to me to be set afire. It's up to me to stir up the gift that's in me. It's up to me to let that fire erupt within me and not lie dormant and not lie complacent but oh to seek for that fire to burn to where it flows out of me like Jeremiah said it is like fire shut up in my bones and I can't keep it to myself